Essentially, it's as though we've got two minds in our heads, intimately related, but very separate, very distinct. Now, his um, approach is simply to leave experience in the too hard basket for the time being. Uh, I've actually given a model of experience elsewhere, but we won't go into that for the time being. It's not a, not a, um, essential. What we want to do is give a rational, materialist, non-question begging explanation of mind as a knowledge function. Now, do we have adequate examples of mindless decision making that we can use as a basis for a natural model of dualism? Oh, yes, we most certainly do. Uh, we start with the two great classes of human knowledge. We've got the private mental life, and the, um, which is both common and unique, and we've got the empirical sciences, meaning the neurosciences, anthropology, sociology, evolution, etc. And what we want is a three-pin plug to join them. Uh, we need to be able to link these two together, that is to say, to resolve the mind-brain problem. And just to start off with the empirical sciences, you're all familiar with this type of approach, the um, work here of Peter Shimogi, uh, who's looking at intramodular cortical neuronal structures based around the pyramidal cells. So this is this is the um, typical part of the, what we call the... Um, empirical sciences. We go a little bit further, we've got work by Jeff Hawkins and Dilip George. Hawkins, as some of you will know, is the chap who invented palm computers and he now um, is trying to, is working in the area of artificial intelligence. So they have developed what they call um, a model of uh, intellect or intelligence called the hierarchical temporal memory and that um, works uh, you know, as a decision-making process, and it is entirely mindless. It's mechanised. There's no mind involved, and yet these, this approach can, in fact, solve problems. Um, going a bit further, they have um, looked. They've looked at the cortical columns using their approach for the HTM, and here we have. Um, models of memory. This is another Hawkins who's actually in um, Candle's laboratory at Columbia University and here we've got the um, mechanisms of short and intermediate memory formation in aplesia as we presently understand it. And so we assume that memory in humans is essentially the same. It's a chemical based process which alters the functional reactivity of the, new, of the synapses and sets up memory functions this way. Um, a little bit further on we've got mechanisms of long-term memory formation. So there's um, the, the genome is activated, there's gene expression and proteins are um, secreted and these lead to growth of further synapses so that the long-term memory function appears to be structural changes uh, along the lines that Donald Hebb had pointed out in 1948. And just to go back to um, George and Hawkins again, this is their notional circuit for calculating the belief distribution uh, in their hierarchical temporal memory using what they call Markov chains. I don't um, claim to be able to follow their maths very well, I'm afraid. It's a bit too complicated for me. Um, now here, in this picture, they've superimposed um, the two previous pictures, and you so see how the uh, biology of the cortex with its separate layers, which you can see down on the right-hand side of this slide, the separate layers and can be related to the um, hierarchical temporal, temporal memory nodes, which are mathematical, of course, they're mathematical functions. So, so what? Where in all of this is the model of mind? The whole point here is that minds have meaning, but molecules don't. So how do mental properties arise in a non-mental matrix? Now, neurons, of course, don't do meaning. They don't do colour, or bravery, or plans, or patriotism, or maths. Of course, maths. They don't do maths. Uh, meaning, and all of the other properties there, mental properties, is a function of neurons, where they are joined in prescribed forms, but it is not a property of neurons. Meaning cannot be reduced to matters of molecules, nor can democracy, concepts like original sin, 
or the negative log of the gross annualized per capita debt, which um, in uh, most countries throughout the world today is exploding. Uh, so in order to give meaning to meaning, we have to look at it as a composite function which emerges from, and by that I mean is assembled from, a wide variety of cerebral functions, and each of them in turn is assembled from lesser functions. And this, of course, is the uh, model of mind put forward by the great Russian neuropsychologist Alexander Luria. And he had a very, very interesting history, but unfortunately we can't go into that. Um, just have a look at him and Wikipedia, fascinating life. Um, and um, his approach was modular. Complex mental functions emerge from the coherent function interaction of dumb neurons. The neurons themselves are stupid. They've got no brains. Uh, but together they form the brain and out of that uh, complex process, uh, mess comes um, the mental properties that we want to explain. So how do we bridge the gap between meaning and neurons? We need a mechanistic, that is to say a non-mentalist, account of meaning and other mental concepts. And in order to do this, we go back in time a little bit to a British mathematician, Alan Turing, who died in 1953. You know, Turing had a tragic history. Uh, he was, of all people on earth, he probably did more to win the Second World War for the Allies because he broke the German Enigma Code. However, in 1953, he was arrested for uh, being gay and was sentenced, and he committed suicide in, rather than accept the sentence. But he said in a paper published, I think in 1952, that by the end of this century, that is by the end of the 20th century, we will talk in terms of machines thinking. That was very, very radical. He had jumped a long way ahead of everybody else and of the um, conceptual tools uh, available at the time. Now, Turing's approach, and remember, of course, that his work in Britain was um, to a fair extent being mirrored in the US by John von Neumann, who was a Hungarian-born mathematician. He's, um, and Turing said, any question a human can ask can be broken down into a series of smaller questions until ultimately each of the little questions is so simple that a machine can answer it. Uh, and he developed the concept of what he called the discrete state machine, and from that came the universal computing machine. Now, the discrete state machine is simplicity in itself. It consists essentially of three elements. You've got an input-output tape, so the tape just goes in and goes out, and uh, um, that's broken down into cells. And you've got a read-write head, and you've got a memory. And the question to be asked is broken down into a series of items of information which are so simple that they can only be in one of two forms either a 1 or a 0, or an on or an off, or something like that. But this is the, the notion of the binary code. And in each cell on that input-output tape, there is one item of information, either a 1 or a 0. And the tape, and remember, of course, that for Turing, the tape, in fact, was a physical paper tape. But for us, it's electronic. It's a data flow in electronic circuits. Uh, it clicks forward one cell at a time, and it is read by the read head. And then whatever's written there is compared with what's coded into the memory. And the memory in those days was um, physical radio valves. A lot of you probably don't remember them, but I certainly do. Um, and in order to change the memory, you actually had to take all the valves out and reinsert them, rewire them. And then a decision was made um, by comparing the input with the memory and the input was either left the same or it was erased and it was changed to the opposite. So if it was a 1 it could be either left as a 1 or erased and changed to a 0. And then once that little operation was done the tape clicked forward and that became the output. Now Turing's, um, one of his insights was to realise that if you coded into the input tape the actual instructions for the machine you coded its program in uh, to the input tape, then you could change the memory. Um, you would have the basis for changing the memory as it was coded. And you actually didn't have the physical means at that time um, because you would still have to change the uh, valves. But 